like I said, my name is Austin. I'm not Pastor Jason. He's here in the building. I saw him earlier. He's here somewhere. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be speaking today, and I'm very excited, like I said, to be wrapping up our God Never Said That series. Um, really, we're talking about cultural beliefs that, um, you know, things that we attribute to God, statements that we attribute to God, but the reality is it's not in the Bible. God did not say that. I, I, for me, I um, personally, I really hate f- when I feel like I've been misrepresented, right? If my wife and I are having an argument, which basically never happens, right? Because we, we love each other and we have a perfect marriage, right, babe? She's right here on the front row. But occasionally when we have a disagreement, I won't even call it a fight, an argument, I, it, it, a pet peeve of mine is if I feel like my words have been twisted or if I feel like I'm being accused of saying something that I did not say. Can anybody relate to that? Like that gets me. And I imagine God kind of feels like that a little bit when we tell somebody, hey, God will never give you more than you can handle, right? God did not say that. It's not in the Bible. And so we've been going through and look at some statements that even if we've, if it's our first week or we've grown up in church, things that we can attribute to God, misconceptions, things that he did not actually say. If you've got your Bible, I would love for you to open it up to Matthew chapter 18. That's going to be our main text this morning, Matthew chapter 18. Uh, But before we get into that, I'm going to kind of let you know. I, I hope you had a great weekend. I, uh, I had a great weekend. I took my, my boys, my two boys, we took them to Silvadar City for the very first time. We actually went with Derek and Amanda, who are here right on the front row. But, you know, you, there's certain things that happen, and you just realize what stage of life you're in. Like, we went through the whole day. We're riding roller coasters. We're eating turkey legs and kettle corn, and it's amazing. And my four-year-old decides he wants to ride this massive water slide. Like, like they were not really old enough. Like they, they brought out the measuring stick and it was like just touching right on the line of my boy's head. Like they were like, they even questioned my wife, like, are you sure, are you sure that your three and four year old are okay riding this ride? And it was fine. They freaked out. My three year old especially had the fear of God in his, in his eyes as they lifted us up. What's it called? Mystic uh, River. Some of y'all know Branson. I know you know Silver City. Mystic, Mystic River Falls. A three year old should not be riding that ride. But anyway, I realized what season of life I'm in because after we got done, I just, I thought to myself, I am too old to get drenched with water and then have to walk around in public for two, three more hours, right? Like I just, it's, there's no part of me that wants to do that. That has nothing to do with the message today, but we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, and I just felt like I needed to share that with you guys. But tonight, today we're going to be talking about the, God never said that, the statement, forgive and forget, Forgive and forget. Have any of you ever heard that, been told that? Maybe you're struggling with holding on. Somebody did something to you. You're holding a grudge. Somebody says, hey, just, just forgive and forget. Move on. Get on with your life. The reality is that I don't even think that's humanly possible. When something is important to us, when something significant happens in our life, I don't think as human beings we even have the ability to forget about it. God definitely calls us to forgive, but does not necessarily call us to forget. And so, we're going to be talking about forgiveness this morning. If I, if I try to forget about something, that actually just makes me think about it more, right? Like I, I love Bluebell ice cream, and I go into Walmart. Some of you are Ben & Jerry's fans. Some of you like Yarnell. For me, I walk in down the ice cream aisle. I've got blinders on. It's just Bluebell ice cream. If my wife comes home with a, ga- a half gallon of Bluebell ice cream, some cookie two steps in the freezer. I can do my best to forget about it. I can think, I can do my best. I can, I can pray. I can meditate. I can think about kale and salad and grilled chicken, but that's just going to, I can't forget about that ice cream that's in the freezer, right? The more we try to forget, the more we, we remember in a lot of ways is at least how my human nature works. And so we're going to talk about this statement, forgive and forget, and how Jesus actually t- teaches us and tells us to forgive. So I said we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18, but first I want to take a look at Matthew chapter 6. Um, This is a, this is another passage. This is the, what, what is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. It appears in multiple gospels, and this is Jesus, probably his most famous sermon, his most famous message. And in Matthew chapter 6, right before what we're going to read here in verse 14, Jesus teaches his, his followers and this crowd how to pray. It's the Lord's Prayer, right? We, a lot of us know the Lord's Prayer. And in part of that Lord's Prayer, he says, Lord, forgive us our sins or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have sinned against us, right? As we forgive. So it's a two-part statement there. It's not just Lord, forgive us. It's forgive us as we forgive others. And so that's part of the Lord's Prayer. But then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, we're going to look at it together. Jesus expands on that statement a little more. So you got Lord's Prayer, but then in in verse 14, he says, for if you forgive men... When they sin against you, 
your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. If we're followers of Jesus, I think this should stop us in our tracks right there. Um, because what, what is Jesus saying? To me, Jesus is saying that if we're not willing to offer forgiveness to other people, then how can our Father, how can God offer forgiveness to us? Now, all of us, if, if we, hopefully, I, I hope that we know that we are saved by grace. We don't earn the love of God. We don't earn the grace of God. We don't earn the forgiveness of God. So what this says to me is that if we're not, it, it, it causes us the question, if we're not at a place where we can forgive other people, I think we have to look inward and say, have I really experienced the grace of God? Because once we experience forgiveness, once we experience the grace of God, the only option is to, to be people who forgive. And so that's in Matthew chapter 6. And before we go any further, I just want to acknowledge for a minute, because we're going to be talking about forgiveness today. This can be a heavy topic. This is not easy to, it's easy to talk about forgiving somebody that, you know, cuts us off in traffic or maybe says something flippantly and we got to let them off the hook. But some of you have been through some, some stuff. Some of you have been through some painful things. Some of you have been uh, victims of abuse. Some of you have been victims of verbal abuse in your home. You grew up in a home with parents that didn't, didn't love you, treat you like they should have. You were never good enough, never told you were proud of, never told you were loved. Some of you are victims of physical abuse, family members, or friends. Some of you have suffered sexual abuse. Some of you have been mistreated, bullied, gossiped about, uh, taken advantage of. I just want to stop for a second. I, I'm not trying to come at you and, and say, I know your story. I don't. I know in a room like this, there have been some painful, painful experiences. So I want us to go through this text together and just ask, what is God, what is God asking us to do? What is God telling us to do? Not what is Austin telling you what to do. What is God asking us to do as followers of Jesus? So I know this is heavy, but I want us to go through it together. So I want to look at today, what, what, is, what is real forgiveness? I think sometimes in order to look at what forgiveness is, it's easier to go back and look at what forgiveness is not, right? It's easier to identify sometimes what is it not, and then we can talk about how God asks us to do it. So we're going to take a lot of notes today. If you've got your note sheet, there's nine points. So we're going to, you know, just keep that pen clicked out. We're going to take a lot of notes. Um, and I hope, that, I, I think if we apply this, if we really let God work on us here, it could change our lives. So number one, real forgiveness is not forgetting the offense. I'm not going to spend much time on this because this is, that's what we just talked about. It would be great if we could just forgive someone and delete our memory and move on, but that, that's, not how, that's not how our brains work. That's not how we work as human beings. So forgiving is not forgetting the offense, and, and Scripture does not say that we have to do that. Number two, forgiveness is not minimizing the pain. It's not minimizing the pain. To be honest, this is my tendency. Something happens to me. Someone hurts me. My tendency is to get a week or two removed and go, that wasn't that big of a deal, right? They, maybe, they didn't, maybe they didn't really mean it like that. Can anybody else relate to that? To, in order to avoid the conflict, my tendency is to minimize the pain and say, well, maybe that didn't really happen like that. Or maybe, maybe they didn't really mean it like that. But the reality is sometimes people do hurt us. Sometimes people do mean it. Sometimes people do things, and, and we don't want to cheapen the offense and then cheapen the forgiveness that, that we're called to give them, right? Now, with that being said, I do think that as Christians, we don't need to walk around looking for ways to be offended, right? We don't, we, I think we, the Bible talks about in Proverbs 19, it says that it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. To overlook doesn't mean to ignore. That, that word in the, in the Hebrew, it means to pass over. So it means that we acknowledge something, but we choose we choose to pass over it. We're not, we're not overlooking it, but we, we choose to look over it. For instance, somebody look, gives you a bad look in the lobby, maybe just assume that they had to go to the bathroom, right? Like maybe like, I do think as Christians, we're called to assume the best in people. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, give them the benefit of the doubt and assume they were in a rush, they didn't see you. If somebody sends you a text and it didn't have as many exclamation points and emojis as you thought it should have, just give that person the benefit of the doubt. And I'm kind of making light of it, but the reality is, if we, if we are looking to be offended, we're always going to find what we're looking for. And I just think there's a balance, and this is where we have to ask God to give us wisdom. God, give me the wisdom to acknowledge when I've been hurt and when there's pain and when I've been thinking about somebody and, and in my mind, 
have an ill will towards them for months and years? Or is it something where maybe they were just having a bad day and they didn't mean it like that? Like, maybe we don't need to jump in every single debate, political debate on Facebook and look for a way to get offended, right? We have to find that balance of we're, we're living our lives on mission. And our mission is to love people and to share the gospel of Jesus with them. And we can't let any, anything distract us from that. A small offense distract us from that. But all that being said, there are times when people hurt us. There are times when there's real pain and real things that, that needs to be dealt with. And we don't, forgiveness is not minimizing the pain. Number three, forgiveness is not trusting the person. When someone hurts us, we're going to look at scripture that shows us that we are called to forgive them immediately. We're about, but we don't have to trust them immediately. Trust has, is earned. Many times trust has to be rebuilt. In fact, it would be pretty foolish to just forgive and immediately trust that same, this, the person with the same level of trust that they had before. For some, for some people, that relationship is not going to look the same for a long time. But we're still called to forgive them. We're still called to offer them grace. But then we have to evaluate with wisdom what does that relationship look like. So forgiveness is not immediately trusting that person the same way. So I mentioned Matthew 18. That's where I want to go next. If you've got your Bibles, open that up. We'll have it on the screens. There's going to be a lot of verses we're going to pause and give some context and break it up. But this is Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, and, and Peter approaches him with a question. Does anybody watch The Chosen in here? Some people love The Chosen. Some people do not. Regardless, it's, I've watched some of it, not all of it, but it's impossible for me to think about Peter now without thinking of him with a tank top and just doing way too many bicep curls with his cut-off robe. If you watch The Chosen, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, if you don't, just ignore that part. But... Peter, he comes up to Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, and this is what he says in verse 21. Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. So a little bit of historical context that will help us understand here, I think. Jewish rabbis, the the law, what they would teach people is that you were required to, to forgive people three times. Three times, and at that point, you can write somebody off. You can be done with them. That was pretty generous, right? Forgive somebody three times for the same offense. So Peter, he is, in my opinion, he's looking for a little bit of extra credit right here. He's saying, Jesus, seven times? Should I forgive somebody seven times? Isn't that awesome of me? Isn't that righteous of me, Jesus? And, and the other thing we have to understand is that seven is the number of perfection. It's the number of completion in the Bible. It's no accident that the number seven pops up right here. It, we can look in Scripture. The, there were seven days of creation. Uh, the temple was uh, in Jerusalem was built in seven years. The tabernacle was dedicated on the seventh day. Uh, there were seven churches in the book of Revelation, seven angels of those seven churches. I could keep going, but the, the, this reference to seven being a number of completion or perfection, it's over 700 times in both the Old and New Testament. So seven, it's a, anytime we see seven in the Bible, it's a meaningful number. There's, there's something there. So With that context, Jesus says, no, Peter, you forgive 70 times seven. Jesus is not telling us that we forgive 490 times. If we've got any math, math, quick math, you know, public math, like he's not saying forgive somebody 490 times. And after that, you can, you know, write them off. You're dead to me. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, Peter, if you follow me, you continually forgive. You forgive over and over. You you forgive as many times as it takes. Peter, if you're a follower of me, you're a forgiver. That's what you do. And so our, our spiritual responsibility that we have from God when it comes to forgiveness is to actually forgive. That's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus is to actually forgive. So then after, after Jesus answers Peter's question and ups the ante in verse 23, he continues with a parable. And I want us to read that together in verse 23. Matthew 18, verse 23. Jesus says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. 
His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of his other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man who had been forgiven, or called the man in who he had forgiven, and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison and and had him tortured until he had paid the entire debt. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So, if you're taking notes, we're going to jot down three reasons that God commands us to forgive. So the why, why does God command us to forgive? And then then we're going to talk about the how. How do we actually forgive people? So, number one, we forgive, we forgive because we have been forgiven. Number one, you forgive because you have been forgiven. Man, the servants, think, think about this servant's reaction. He had just been forgiven millions, millions of dollars of debt and his immediate reaction to the servant that owed him money is to start choking him, like choke slam, like WWE style choke slam. And this seems crazy to us, but in Roman law, the, the law was that actually you could legally choke someone you had legal right to choke someone who owed you money. Some of you are thinking that's not the craziest idea, right? That, that might be something we could think about bringing. But like we go out to eat and you say, no, I don't want any of the appetizer. I ordered the breadsticks. You eat over half of it. I'm like, bro, I know you, you're supposed to Venmo me, right? Like you owe me money. Like I know your Venmo is working. Like you could choke people who owed them money. But seriously, why? Let's think, I want you to think about this for a second. Why would a man who had been forgiven millions refuse to forgive this debt of someone who had owed just a few thousand? My thought is that I wonder if he truly understood the depth of the forgiveness that he had received. Like, I wonder if he thought somehow I'm not really debt free, right? Like, I I know we had this conversation and I begged and I pleaded with my master, but am I, am I really forgiven? Like, I don't believe that he thought that he was forgiven because when forget, we're forgiven a debt like that, it changes, it changes things in our life. Um, many of you, or some of you, I think you've, you've been in church for a long time, you love Jesus, but you still question, have I been forgiven? I know God's forgiven me for this or for that, but that one thing in my life, did he, have I really been forgiven? And to get to a place of forgiveness for other people, we have to we have to stop and, and truly comprehend the depth of our own forgiveness. So number one, we see this in this parable. We forgive because we have been forgiven. We are forgiven, so we forgive. Number two, God commands us to forgive because resentment does not work. Resentment does not work. Ephesians 4.31 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Is there something that causes rage and anger inside of you? As I was thinking about this, for me, it's when I'm driving in the left-hand lane on the interstate. I'm going the speed limit, maybe even a little above, okay? And then someone comes flying up on the right-hand lane. I've got a car in front of me. I can't go anywhere. They fly up on the right-hand lane. They try to do some, like, drift maneuver to, like, get in front of me. Do you all know what I'm talking about? My natural reaction, like anyone, is to, to floor it and get as close as I possibly can to the car in front of me with my wife scolding me and saying, think about our children in the background. It's not the right thing, but it's what I do. It says, get rid of rage, anger, and, and bitterness. When we have unforgiveness in our life, it causes us to carry around bitterness. It's an invisible weight that we carry around. It, it, it affects the way that we walk into rooms. It affects the way that we walk into relationships. It affects the way that we walk into church. We don't trust people. We're resentful. Uh, we have our guard up. We don't trust people. I don't know who, I, 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 this quote, I've, I've heard it and I've seen it, and I've seen it attributed to a lot of different people. So I'm not even going to, I don't know who, it's, who said it, but I know, it's, I know it's true. Resentment is like drinking poison and then expecting the other person to die. Think about that for a moment. Think about the insanity in that. Resentment, you could say bitterness. It's like drinking poison, and then somehow thinking it's going to cause the other person to die. 
really it just affects us. Really it just hurts us. Unforgiveness, it prevents us from being in healthy relationships. It prevents us from having joy. It prevents us from having freedom. And so resentment, it doesn't. It's like an invisible weight that we, that we carry around. And the, and the reality is when we're hurt and we don't deal with it and we don't forgive people like God has called us to do, hurt people hurt people. Offended people offend people. But the flip side of that is that healed people are able to bring healing to other people. People that have been healed are allowed, are, 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 have the opportunity to share your story and bring the same grace and, and truth from Jesus to others. So number two. We forgive because resentment does not work. Number three, we forgive because your future depends on it. Your future depends on it. If you're taking notes, write this down. Forgiveness is not going to change your past, but it can change your future. Forgiving someone is not going to change what they did to you. It's not going to be a time-traveling mechanism. It can't change your past, but it can change your future. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus said, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Jesus is saying, stop. If you, if you realize you've got unforgiveness, stop what you're doing. Go deal with that. Forgive them, and then come back, and your Father will forgive you. And then you can. So unforgiveness, it, it literally blocks our prayers. For some of you, unforgiveness, it's a lid on your life. It's a lid on your purpose. Um, it's a lid on your freedom. It's a lid on your joy. It's a lid on all kinds of, it's a chasm between where you are and where God wants you to be because you're holding on to something that you, you don't know if you can let it go. You don't know how to let it go. You think if somehow you let it go, this anger, resentment, this grudge, if you let it go, the other person is going to win. But the reality is you're going to win if you let this go. You'll get your life back. That's what, that's what Jesus says. In, in, in Mark. Craig Rochelle tells a, tells a story. He's a pastor out of uh, Oklahoma. And he tells a story and had the transparency to share that when he was, <clears throat> when he was younger, he found out that his, his, his little sister had been molested. Um, and it wasn't from a stranger. It was from someone in the, that was well-known in the community. Someone that had a good, a good reputation in the community. He was a family friend. He taught their family racquetball and was around at games and just, it was just a well-known person. And once he became a Christian, he was faced with the reality that he was, God was calling him to forgive this person, this person that he had held a grudge. And all of us would say re reasonably so, right? It makes me angry just, just thinking about it. But God started to deal with him and, and, and make him realize that there was a level of freedom that he did not have until he, was gonna, until he chose through faith to release this person to release the grudge, to forgive this person. So eventually he wrestled with God about this and got to a place where he realized that if, if I want freedom, this is what I have to do. He ended up writing this man a letter and gave it to him while he was in hospice care, releasing him, forgiving him, and, and by the grace of God, walking in freedom from that moment. I hope that none of us have to walk through pain like that, or walk through a, a situation like that, but the reality is, our future depends on our ability to forgive. So we forgive because our future depends on it. You're the most like Jesus when you forgive someone who doesn't deserve it. You're the most like Jesus when you forgive someone who does not deserve it. So that's the why. But the scripture makes it very clear. We're called to forgive people. Even when it's painful, even when it hurts, there's freedom on the other side of it. So that's the why. So now I want to talk about, as we, as we start to close, I want to talk about how. How do I forgive someone? Just three things. Number one, I acknowledge my own imperfections. Acknowledge my own imperfections. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in our mess. Before we had cleaned ourselves up, Christ died for us. You ever do something that, you know, I've been... I've been a dad now for four years, and I've done some incredibly stupid things as a dad, if I was to be honest with you. Some of them, I'm not even going to share them up here because, you know, it just there's no need for that. But I was thinking about, as I acknowledge my own imperfections, I was thinking about two things that happened. Just this last week, it took me a few days to even tell my wife about this. But I, I got my boys in the car. My, my wife was working. I was like, we're going to get the boys out of the car, run some errands. And I put my sons in the car, and I get about halfway to where we're going. And my four-year-old says, hey, Dad. Uh, Mav doesn't have any pants on. 
I turned around, I looked, and sure enough, my three-year-old is sitting there in a diaper. Now listen, when you've got a six-month-old, eight-month-old, and they're in their diaper, it's super cute, right? I've got a three-year-old with a nasty mullet, and he, that dude is not going to roll up into a store with no pants on, okay? And I just, I start to think, how did I let this happen? Like, how did I get in the car and realize that one of my sons did not have any pants on? I'll blame it on a lack of sleep. But the other situation I started thinking about is we were driving from Fayetteville to Conway one day. And uh, we drove all the way there. It was a great trip. And we pull into Conway. And my boys are both buckled in the car seats. And uh, we pull up to a light. We get off the interstate. We're going somewhere. And we pull up to a light. And we make a left-hand turn. And in that moment, it was like slow motion. On the left-hand turn, I realized that one of my sons, his car seat is not, is not buckled in. Like he's in the car seat. But it's not buckled into anything. And he does one of these numbers right here and just completely collapses in the back seat. And my other son's laughing. He, he has this look like, what just happened? My wife told me not even to tell that story because it's, um, you know, the danger that was involved in there. But I've done some incredibly dumb things as a dad. But when I think about this point, how do I forgive someone? We acknowledge our own imperfections. I think the quickest way to get to a place of forgiveness is to think about our own lives. Think about, some, you know, the, it's painful to go here, but the darkest moment of our own lives, things that we wouldn't really want anyone else to know about, the seasons of our life where we think back, God loved us in those moments. God forgave us in those moments. God saw us, nothing's hidden from him, and he chose to offer the same grace and the same forgiveness to us right then and there. For me, if I want to get to a place of forgiveness, I just have to go back there in my mind and say, God, thank you. Thank you for your love and your grace. Who am I to withhold that from someone else, right? So we forgive someone by, number one, acknowledging our own imperfections. We understand the depth of our own sin and the extent of God's goodness is going to cause us to love him and to love others more deeply. That's the only way we're going to be able to forgive others the way that God forgives us. So number one, we acknowledge our own imperfections. Number two, we abandon our right to get even. We abandon our right to get even. As you're taking notes right there, just write down, forgiveness is not fair. Forgiveness is not fair. Getting even can be, it can feel good. Getting even feels like the right thing to do, right? That's what what the world says. Somebody hurts you, hurt them back. Somebody betrays you write them off, right? That's what, they like, find a way to get even. Romans chapter 12 says, never take revenge. Romans 12, 19, leave that to the righteous anger of God, for the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. If we go back to our parable that we read in Matthew chapter 18, the, the wicked servant, the law gave him the right to get even. He was within the law to do exactly what he did. He had been forgiven millions. He was still within the right to withhold forgiveness to the, to the other man that owed, owed him thousands. But the reality is the forgiveness that he received should have trumped the law. He, he didn't understand the depth of his forgiveness. Forgiveness is saying, you deserve to be hurt. You deserve for me not to ever talk to you again. You, you deserve for me to wish evil on you, but I release that. I'm releasing that right that I have because of the grace of God. So, no, so number two, we for, <clears throat> the, one of the ways that we forgive is we abandon our right to get even. And then number three, how do we forgive? We ask God to bless them. This feels like, <laughs> this is a little too far, right? When you think about some painful things that have happened to you, things that people have done, it's not easy Um, to ask God to bless them. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five. Once again, this is the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I'm on board for this right here, right? What does that mean? Love the people that love you, love your friends, love the people that you vibe with, that have never done anything to hurt you, that you get along with, love those people and then hate your enemy. Jesus said, you've heard that this was said. This is the norm. This is the cultural norm. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
If you study Jesus for very long, you're going to figure out this is an upside down kingdom that he presents. Most of the things that Jesus presents as a way for us to live go against our natural way of functioning as a human being. It's, that's why it's an upside down kingdom. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In Luke 6, he says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. So what does that mean for us? Instead of Sitting there and recalling what that person did to us, what they said to us, how could they have done that, repeating the offense over and over in our mind. When that, when that, when that starts to happen, what we're called to do is to stop and pray, God bless them. God, they didn't know, they didn't know what they were doing. I pray to heal them. I pray to bless them. And when we do that, Hopefully our prayer is that God starts to heal them, but what really also happens is God starts to heal us. He starts to heal us from the inside out. We pray for those who abuse us. We pray for those who, who attack us. I'm not saying this is easy. This is radical. This is a radical way to live. I understand the things that, that I'm saying, but it's harder to hate someone that you pray for. And I want to close with this. The most, the most, the most famous example of forgiveness, we look at the cross, right? Jesus, as he stand, he was perfect. He lived a perfect, sinless life, betrayed by those closest to him, hanging on a cross. And the words that he utters are, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. It was common, it was common in that day, and this is a little bit graphic, but people that would, normal human beings, criminals, horrible people that were crucified, they would have to have their tongues cut out because of the words that they were uttering, the curses that they were uttering toward their family, the people that were doing this, which kind of makes sense. You're in pain, you're in agony. Jesus in, in 1 Peter 2, 23, it says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted him himself to him who judges justly. We're all gonna mess up. We're all gonna get this wrong in our lives, but our goal is to be like Jesus. Our goal is to get to this level of forgiveness where we acknowledge that this person tried to hurt me, this person caused me pain, this person caused my family pain. But as a believer, as a Christian, if I'm called to live like Jesus, this is the standard. I'm called to bless those who persecute you. Persecute me, pray for those who are hurting me. Jesus is the example, that's who we follow.